Hi, this is the official podcast of WCD in its third season now. That's the World Congress of Dermatology, which will be held next in Singapore in 2023. I'm Dr. Etienne Wang from the National Skin Centre of Singapore and I will be your host for this podcast. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts and wherever else you get your podcasts. In this podcast, I speak with dermatologists and skin researchers from all over the world to talk about all things dermatology. And today, my co-host, Ellie, is back with another Derm topic for discussion. Hi, Ellie. Welcome back to Season 3. Hi, Etienne. Wow, time really flies. It's like season three already. <laughs> yes, and we're, we're almost about half a year away from the WCDs. I think everyone's very excited. It is so exciting. And we just had a physical meeting recently. That was really nice as well. Recently, we had an in-person meeting as well for the organizing committee and you were playing the harp, I see. Yeah, it was fun to see everybody together. That was nice. Yes. And I look forward really to the main meeting as well. Yeah, very talented, Ellie. And I hear you'll be playing the harp as well for the WCD. Yes, I will be. Um, we're going to be playing the anthem for the ILDS. That will be exciting. The ILDS anthem. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So back to business. What yeah. topic do you have to discuss with us today? Yeah. So in episodes ago, you and Lester were discussing the importance of screening for mental health issues because a lot of patients with skin diseases have associated anxiety and depression and how mental health and skin diseases actually have some shared uh, inflammatory cytokine profile. So this brain-skin connection is quite a real thing. Today I was thinking how we can discuss, um, you know, about creating a system that effectively and cost-efficiently can address the mental health issues of our patients. Hmm, Okay, how do you propose we do that? Yeah, so I mean, I think there are different tiers in terms of how uh, how resource-intensive and maybe therefore how effective they are. So the easiest thing to start off with would be like referral pathways. If you are able to identify and then refer them off to psychologists and psychiatrists, that'll be easy. The next level will be upskilling the dermatologist. So this could be through informal settings like talks from psychiatrists and psychologists or a formal training, for example, certain dermatologists with an interest undergo like a recognized psychotherapy program. And then even more um, higher up the next level would be like multi-dip meetings or discussions. It can be between healthcare providers, like uh, dermatologists can consult psychologists on a difficult patient that they've had Or it can be in the form of multi-dip clinics where you have psychiatrists and psychologists that come into your dermatology setting to either run separate clinics or co-run the same clinics with you. But uh, that clearly requires a bit more resources as well. But right now, I think one of the main obstacles uh, getting mental health is is the stigma associated with mental health. Um, A lot of the patients that we see resist referral to psychiatrists. So I think having a dermatologist that's trained in mental health care is actually a very, very good idea. Do you have any examples of this? Yeah, um, what you said is really quite important also about how patients uh, are reluctant to seek mental health care. I think increasingly there is a bit less of an issue, but... We do want to be conscious about how we phrase it to the patient. A lot of times, I think we had this discussion before that it might come across as the dermatologist being very dismissive if you say that, oh, I think, you know, your depression is contributing to your skin flares. Maybe you should go see somebody else instead. So it's about rephrasing and reframing their mindset in a way that's also sensitive to their emotions, that you're not just trying to send them away and dismissing their concerns. So I think it's it's important in the way that we reframe um, how their mind actually influences their skin. You're asking about whether there were uh, dermatologists who have been trained. I think in Singapore, there are no dermatologists that I know that have like some form of formal uh, psychiatry or psychology kind of training. I'm not sure if you're aware. Um, no, I don't think so. But we do have some doctors who ha- do have a special interest in what we call psychodermatology or mm. mental health. And they do run clinics concurrently with visiting psychiatrists. You did mention how uh, a way to reframe the way the mind, body, skin axis works. Um, is Do you have a kind of a script or kind of a advice for our dermatologist listeners <laughs> on how you can, they can approach this with their patients? Yeah, so something that I've been trying with my patients um, is not really proven, but how I explain to them is that their skin, like their eczema, is because their skin cells are being naughty. They like to act up. And what do they act up against? Sometimes they act up against things in the environment. For example, when it's hot and sweaty and they don't like it and they become angry. And sometimes, like little children, our skin cells become angry if we are unhappy if we are feeling upset, if we didn't have enough sleep, and then you just act out and be naughty. And when I explain it in this way, I think some of them, they kind of get an understanding of how there can be external and internal triggers for their skin condition. And importantly, I also do explain to them that 
Our skin cells are just naughty for no good reason and for no identifiable trigger because we also want them to understand that not everything is something that they can control necessarily. Mm. I think also if you're going to go the route of skin cells, you want to talk about the naughty nerve cells as well. Because um, when you talk about the mental health and skin, you have two sets of nerves at least. Well, two sets of nerves that might be affecting it, right? One is the sensory nerves and the other ones are the nerves that are controlling the sensory nerves that can be affected by your mood and your thoughts and your central nervous system. Mm, that's a very good point. I wouldn't start to invert that into my script. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, is there anything else you want to add to this topic? No, I think that's about it. I mean, I think this space is very exciting and I do hope that, you know, at least in Singapore, we'll develop increased capabilities for this. Mm. The other thing about mental health is that now, that I think the new generation is much more uh, much more open to talking about mental health uh, a bit to a fault because I believe I've read some articles recently that on TikTok people are just diagnosing themselves and um, coming up with um, all sorts of mental health diagnoses and making it part of their identity what do you think about that if a patient came to you let's say a young patient came to you and insisted that this was you know this is kind of the opposite insisted that their skin is because they had you know um, ADD or they had OCD or something like that um, that's quite interesting. I've not come across that, but I think, you know, the first thing that strikes my mind is, is there an underlying intention? Is there something that they're trying to gain? I know that some people, they um, identify with themselves with a mental health disorder for some form of secondary intent, whether or not it may be conscious or subconscious to them. So I think that's important to first assess. Yes, and I think that's also where our basic training comes in, where we need to be able to screen these patients to see whether this mental health thing is really a significant thing and maybe apply some of the tools that we have, such as depression skills and anxiety skills that we can use in the clinic. Mm -hmm. It might be useful to have these readily available in the clinic. Yeah, I do think so as well. I think maybe a lot of dermatologists, we're not sure what to do and we do not have the time to do it. So if we provide this information to them in a way that's easy for them to administer, it will really help. Okay, well, thank you, Ali. That was, that was another very uh, stimulating discussion. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Uh, thanks, Etienne. Take care and see you soon. Okay, bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> and now I'd like to welcome to the podcast Professor Jean Bologna, Professor of Dermatology at Yale School of Medicine. She has been the President of the Medical Dermatological Society and Secretary General of the ILDS, amongst many other positions. She was awarded the American Academy of Dermatology Gold Medal in 2019. And she's most well known for writing the textbook of dermatology. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the podcast, uh, uh, Professor Bologna. Jean? Thank you very much. And Jean, um, uh, t tell me, how is it like right now doing dermatology in the U.S.? Well, I think we feel that we're in a peri-COVID period. Um, I think we have clinics running a bit more normally. I think that in the hospital, we're not seeing all those gravely ill patients um, that had COVID prior to the vaccines being administered. And so it's almost back to normal. And your practice is um, a lot of melanoma and nevi, is that right? Yes, I have a group of patients that I take care of who have melanoma and multiple nevi and family history of melanoma. But I also have become a geriatric dermatologist because many of the patients that I started seeing 30 and almost 40 years ago have stayed with me and have aged with me and are now in their 80s, 90s, and some close to 100 years of age. And so um, I definitely have become a geriatric dermatologist as well. Oh, wow. Um, so geriatric dermatology is, is something that has been spoken about recently. Um, what do you think are the main issues in geriatric dermatology that um, you think young dermatologists should look out for, other than skin cancers? Other than skin cancer is the fact that they're very worried about solar purpura, for one thing. Oh, yes. uh, there's not yes. much we can do about it, but we can explain it. And especially for those who've had melanoma, where that dark purple can almost look black and then alarm the patient that perhaps they have another melanoma, explaining the diagnosis uh, helps them 
that said, I at least once, sometimes twice a month, will have someone come in regarding concern of a very dark lesion that's appeared on, usually on the forearms, occasionally on the shins, that turns out to be solar purpura. The thing I think that's different about solar purpura is that unlike an ecchymosis or simple hemorrhage into the skin, the lesions tend to last for four, six weeks, and they don't go through that typical green to yellow transition. And for that reason, I think it does um, worry patients sometimes uh, about, or is it something more serious? And so the other thing I think too, though, as people age is they get corns, they get solar purpura, they get thinning of their hair, and sometimes they'll be honest and say, well, it reminds me of my grandmother. And so I think it also is a reminder of passing time. In addition, you got to be careful about dry skin. That's the number one issue, yeah, especially yeah. for us in the winter. Osteotonic <laughs> eczema can be prevented. Now, I often use hydrocortisone 2.5% ointment in a pound jar. Now, you might argue that might be placebo, but I find that I get better compliance than just saying, please go home and use Vaseline. And I mm -hmm. find that if I can keep their shins and sometimes their lateral uh, flanks nice and hydrated through the winter, I don't get that horrible autosensitization uh, that you can see when stasis dermatitis and even asteatotic eczema goes wild. So I really think um, that's an important point of geriatric dermatology as well. What challenges do you face um, with your patients during the COVID pandemic? Did you, ha uh, did you do a lot of teledermatology? Oh, I don't like teledermatology. <laughs> I don't think anyone really does. Okay. Um, I did it for those, I think it was about eight to 10 weeks of when we were in shutdown. And I spent more time looking at people's kitchen ceiling and trying my best to focus in on what bothered them. But I will give an example. One patient told me they had an eruption of several days in duration on the right side of their face. And I kept thinking and thinking, was it really just uh, seric dermatitis of their ear or was it early herpes zoster of the ear? But had I been in clinic, I would have within 10 seconds looked at the other side and I wasn't able to do that. And I told her after about 10 minutes of going back and forth, back and forth about pain, pruritus, et cetera, I said, could I just look at your other ear? And sure enough, the changes were bilateral and it was just seric dermatitis. But that's somewhat frustrating. So the ability to do the types of investigation that you do on physical examination got lost. And I found myself always saying, well, as soon as we open up, I'll get you in and we'll take a look at that lesion. Sometimes, obviously, it was not obviously a seborrheic keratosis, but oftentimes it was rather difficult to evaluate. The other problem was that we used this EMR called EPIC, and it had a tiny icon that you had to scroll and try to find to do the telemedicine. Instead, though we were supposed to use EPIC, I would use Doximity, um, because it had just a simple link and my older patients could hit it and talk to me more easily. I found during COVID that they just didn't need one more thing they couldn't do or have control over. So it, it was much nicer to have a simple system rather than a complex system. The other thing that I did enjoy though is that I was more of a social worker when I did a lot of my telemedicine. We would sit and talk about how they were doing. Were they walking outside? Were they at least getting some fresh air, a little bit of exercise? And so that was nice because it was more like chit-chatting over the kitchen table. But on the other hand, doing a total body skin exam is, in my opinion, impossible. There were some dermatologists who were trying to do it, but in my opinion, it was not feasible. Another thing, as I mentioned earlier, that you are known for is writing a very, very comprehensive textbook on dermatology. Um, can you tell me what, what gave you the idea to actually write a textbook in the first place? Well, it started when the people who are now known as Elsevier approached me about getting involved in a book that would compete with Fitzpatrick and Rook. They had tried their hand some years earlier in a book by... Um, June Robinson was involved, 
and a few other professors, but they still couldn't crack the Fitzpatrick monopoly. And so they came to me with an outline that had been prepared by Ron Rapini and asked if I would help with an, another attempt at a textbook. I told them that some of the problems that I thought uh, were issues with Fitzpatrick were that clinical chapters were written by physician scientists who really didn't spend much time in the clinic, that basic science was all in text, whereas I'm a big believer in scientific American method where you show two to three schematics and then the text flows easily uh, after you look at the schematics. And so basic science, in my opinion, should be taught through schematics. In addition, I felt that first six months to even 12 months of dermatology can be daunting. It's not as if you're a cardiology fellow or you know a lot of the terminology and then become more uh, confident of the literature and statistics. Instead, it's a foreign language with thousands of diseases you've never heard of before. So I thought that key features, meaning that if a person just beginning to learn dermatology could learn one or two key features about a disease, they would feel more confident. And the next time they came through, they could learn a few more key features. And then the next time through could learn some more detail. But the idea that you can try to synthesize for someone else what you feel are the one or two or three most important issues or features of particular disease, I think helps someone. You don't want to overwhelm people with lots of details, especially early on in their residency. And were you surprised at its amazing success? Well, yeah. When I was in medical school, I was very much influenced by a book that came out of Johns Hopkins, and it was on internal medicine. And an example would be that when they approached a disorder such as thrombocytopenia, they had a simple algorithm. You either had decreased production or increased destruction. And I thought, why are people making things so complicated when they can make them simple? Sometimes I get accused of oversimplifying, but my feeling has always been that I will bake the cake and give it to you, but you have to supply the icing through the clinic, through your reading of the literature. But by having a firm, straightforward, logical foundation, you can build as big a house as you want. Um, so that's the way I think about medicine, is trying to keep it simple and logical rather than yes, complicated. I, I think a lot of the frameworks that I remember in the schematics in Bologna have definitely stuck with me throughout my entire career. So thank <laughs> you so much for that. And of course, your, your textbook is basically the Bible here in Singapore. So <laughs> we were very, very happy to um, have you as our visiting consultant here about 10 years ago. How did you find Singapore when you visited us? Oh, I had a great time. I was very impressed with the high standards of clinical care at the National Center, even though it was spelled C-E-N-T-R-E -E instead of T-E-R. I let <laughs> that ride. I was so happy to be there. The people were doing great care. Everyone was doing their best. Everyone was so friendly and helpful. At times, I felt that I was almost like a princess, the way people were treating me. Um, I also had beautiful times where I went and saw the gardens in the different environments around the world. I took a stroll through the orchid garden in the morning, and I, I was almost alone. Some botanic gardens. Yeah, botanic it was gardens. just so beautiful and peaceful and restful. And obviously, I love window shopping as well, so that's a, a, another benefit. Um, but I did get teased a little bit there. Well, Roy Chan, he teased me because we took a lot of pictures with me and the residents and the other attendings, and we just kept taking a lot of pictures. And he kept teasing me, saying that he never saw so many pictures being taken in his life. Anyway, that was the only thing that I would say uh, I got teased about. <laughs> and um, you, you were Secretary General for the ILDS. Um, which World Congress was that for? Well, I was the scientific chair 
for the Vancouver meeting when I worked with Mm -hmm. Jerry and Harvey, and we worked very hard on that. And then I was secretary general then after that, before we went to Milan. Yes. And what are you most excited about for Singapore um, uh, next year at RWC? Well, there are so many people from around the world that I haven't seen since before COVID. And I can't wait to see them all. And I can't wait to hear about what people are doing. I find that there's an energy at these World Congresses, especially as people who normally don't get together, see each other, realize that their commonalities and make friendships that last for decades. So the scientific program will be great, but I really am looking forward to just seeing people I haven't seen for years and how are they doing and what are they doing in their country and just reconnecting. And of course, always making new friends as well, because there will always be opportunities to meet young people who are coming into dermatology. And that's always exciting as well. Wow, that's great. Yes, uh, Singapore has pretty much opened up and it's back to normal here. And I think the dermatology meeting is going to be one of the biggest meetings ever in Singapore, if, if everything goes smoothly. Oh, yes, I think it will. Um, I think that uh, people are now realizing that there will be a low level of infectivity, but that it will not lead to hospitalization because of the vaccinations. And Mm -hmm. I have seen a difference in the meetings in the U.S. in the sense that people are more relaxed. And I think that's only going to increase over the coming year, that people get more relaxed. And I think um, our listeners will be very happy to know that in Singapore, we are close to 100%, I think about 98% vaccinated here in Singapore. So um, one of the safest places to be in the world. (laughs) All right. and, And even before COVID, one of the safest places in the world to be. And I think that's very important for everyone, but especially for the women who are attending and who may be coming alone, that they feel safe. And I think that just takes away one of the fears of uh, traveling in a city that you don't know. Absolutely, absolutely. And on that note, I'd like to thank you so much for your time today, um, Jean. Sure. Um, yes, so thank you. And I can't wait to see you again next year. I know. And, and yeah. you tell that president, Roy Chan, that I'm looking forward to seeing him too. Okay? <laughs> I'm sure. All right. I'm sure he's very, very looking forward okay. to seeing you too. Okay. Thank you so Take much, Take care. Jean. Okay. You Bye. be well. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the official podcast of the WCD. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, at WCD2023 Singapore. And check out the WCD website, wcd2023singapore.org, for more updates and content on the WCD. Discounted early bird registration has been extended to lower and lower middle income countries until June. And if you missed the abstract deadline, there will be another chance for late-breaking abstracts in January 2023. And until next time, stay safe and use sunblock.